This is Hear Me Out. I'm Celeste Headley. It's a new year, and is it a new you? The self-help and self-improvement industries are thriving right now and have been for years. This is the season of lofty goal setting designed to better your life. But we also know that most resolutions fail. So when you look at the year to come, let's think about setting resolutions and getting advice. You're probably seeing a lot of advice out there for how to be a better you in 2024. When is that advice worth following? And when should you just let yourself be instead of trying to be better? Think about the resolution that you're making and then go like five steps down. So you can't make your goal lose weight. Your goal should be like, tomorrow I'm going to try to get up from my desk and walk around the block for five minutes. Zach Rosen, podcast host and advice giver, joins us and shares what he thinks might work for you. Stay with us. Welcome back to Hear Me Out. I'm Celeste Headley. As one year ends and another begins, many of us are inspired to set big, lofty goals for ourselves in the new year. Maybe you'll start a new diet or an exercise plan, spend less money, stop swearing. Maybe this is the year you're going to quit social media, quit smoking, or finally organize your kitchen. But you probably know where I'm going with this. By some estimates, around 80% or more of people who set New Year's resolutions have given up on them by the time we get to February 1. So when you see all those listicles and social media posts about how to finally self-actualize in 2024, and we know you're probably seeing a lot of them, what advice is actually worth listening to? Could it be that self-improvement is actually an attainable thing and not just a buzzword for selling books and workshops in early January? Now, I should say, I'm going to argue against the setting of big lofty goals in this podcast. And for those who have read any of my books, you might say, wait, you write self-improvement books. I don't think I do. (laughs) Um, And my stance is that most people don't really know how to set good, productive goals for themselves. And so often um, their efforts at reaching these goals are counterproductive because the goal in itself was flawed. But for our first show of 2024, we felt like this conversation was very relevant. And who better to talk about this with us than Zach Rosen? He is the co-host of Slate's Care and Feeding Parenting Podcast. But he also hosts a self-improvement podcast, I think it's fair to say that, called The Best Advice Show. So Zach, welcome. Thank you, Celeste. So nice to see you. (laughs) Good to see you, too. Is there anything else for those who don't know you that you want to add to your little short biography I gave there? I mean, yes. In 2005, I didn't know what the hell I was going to do with my life. I thought, oh, maybe I could like do public radio because that seems cool. Um, I don't want to get a real job. And so I emailed this person at Detroit Public Radio. Her name is Celeste Headley. And I was like, hey, I heard you just started this arts and culture show. I've been making radio here at my college. Do you need any help? And you replied and said yes. And you <laughs> hired true. me for my first job. And I have never looked back. And I I entirely owe the, the beginning of my career to you, Celeste. So I am forever grateful to you. And uh, I think people need to know that. I, I should also mention, I mean... Thank you very much. It was a That's nothing twenty but a, years a, ago, dude. A pleasure. It is. We're we're freaking old. Um, I should also mention you. You gave me good advice even back then. Really? Uh, because I remember at one point you and the, your cohorts had screwed something up, and I yelled <laughs> at you. And as you all tried to not laugh at me, you said, "You know, Celeste, you you might want to not rule by fear. That's not really? going to work for you." <laughs> yes. I don't remember that. <laughs> yeah. I believe it, but I don't remember it. And yeah, yeah. Did, did you change your ways? I did. I kind of gave up on trying to intimidate people because you guys were all giggling as I was super angry. So fear is never going to work for me. In any case, (laughs) (laughs) I set a goal of not doing that anymore and I reached it. See, Um, it's possible. (laughs) You just proved yourself wrong already two minutes into the show. Okay. All right. I didn't say people can't change. Okay. Okay. So let's start with your sort of elevator pitch. What's your brief... Um, articulation of your opinion here. I agree that big lofty goals are not particularly helpful. I gave up on New Year's resolutions some time ago, 
You but did. I have, yeah. So, so my whole thing is, I'm all about resolutions, and I am all about small, super specific resolutions. So I think that's the problem. New Year's resolutions are big and lofty, and that's ridiculous. Uh, I think what's the opposite of lofty? Uh, no slope. So like small, <laughs> baby small, steps, infl- yeah. yeah, small right. baby steps um, are what I believe are achievable. And, uh, and, and I think that like, if you're going to be making a new year's resolution, that's great. But like, think about the resolution that you're making and then like go like five steps down. So for instance, like I want to lose weight this year, which is, I know a very popular one and people are very. like coming off of like cookie season, um, yep. which I am very uh, much in the middle of right now. You can't you can't make your goal like lose weight. Your goal should be like tomorrow I'm going to try to get up from my desk and walk around the block for 5 minutes. So I I actually agree with that. So maybe we're starting here from a period of, of agreement. And I I mean, I think one opposite of lofty antonym of lofty would probably be humble, which works, right? Yes. I agree that choosing really specific small changes is the way to, to, if you really want to change your life, I agree with you there. So yeah. I feel like we're starting here from a place of common ground. Okay. Then this the episode's place, over. Yeah, and we're done. No. Okay. <laughs> so here's wh- where I get a little itchy. Mm-hmm. The, the way that people choose goals is um, often misguided to my mind. And mm-hmm. you might disagree with me. Okay. Um, people will you know, read some article that says the eight things every successful CEO does before 7 a.m. Or here's here's what uh, Bill Gates does um, every afternoon. Um, and they'll be like, okay, I'm going to make my bed every morning. Now that, I think, adheres to your standards, right? Mm-hmm. That's a small, mm-hmm. measurable mm-hmm. goal. Mm-hmm. But to my mind, it's still bad. Mm-hmm. Because making your bed might work for Bill Gates, um, but that doesn't mean it works for everybody else. I have been finding through my show um, that there that we are all already in our own way, like doing something that someone else might find helpful. We are all just like somehow getting through the day, which is the goal. Some of us, I think, are doing it um, without much consciousness we're just kind of doing it but with with our own ways of just getting through that i find um might be helpful for other people and so the thing that i'm interested in on my show is not so much talking to like you know like tim ferris he's like he talks to like the world's highest achievers that that's a bit of a turnoff to me i'm really interested in like the everyday wisdom of like random ass people um, and I have found when they share those things that they do to help make their lives better or less depressing, I sometimes hear those and I'm like, oh, cool, I might want to try that. And so, you know, the mission of my show is like you hear this thing and you can, and the advice is always like actionable. You can hear it and then try to embody it that day if you want, but you don't have to. You can also be like, oh, this is this is kind of dumb. I don't want to try this. Um, and so I think like the... Part of the problem is, and this isn't like an uh, an anti intellectualism from me, but I think like we're looking to like these super vaunted, revered, you know, public intellectuals too much, and we should just be like talking to our neighbors about like how they, you know, get through. Does that make sense? I think it does. So let me try and and um, do the opposite of what I normally do. I mean, normally I get people up on here who, with whom I disagree mightily. Uh And then I try to find the areas of common ground. So it Mm -hmm. sounds like in broad strokes, we agree, but I I have to say as much as I, I really like James clear and I think he's a super nice guy. Um, I, I cannot stand that book atomic habits Yeah, because it, it really systematizes all these so-called self-improvement things. Like he's basically asking people to examine every part of their life that they think is going wrong and find these tiny little ways and measure it and journal about it. And, and I, 
he's doing what you're talking about in some way, right? He's he's making things not he's giant. Making achievable, yeah. Yeah, he's making them uh. achievable. But the end result are people who are so self-conscious and so constantly in the process of becoming that they never just be. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm not a good systems thinker. And I think that's part of why I want to, my show is kind of this, uh, this random collection of advice rather than could like, you as because you said systems thinker could you real quickly uh, explain the difference between those approaches in other words james clear talks about um addressing things from a systemic approach what does that mean well i haven't read his book <laughs> oh for, but for you when you say i'm not a yeah, systems yeah, thinker yeah. what do you mean like i think in ge- I'm, I, I find like um systems thinkers are often not always but 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 can be type a they're usually pretty organized. Um, they have uh, a to-do list that they can actually like follow through. Um, they uh, don't buy like broccoli at the store twice. Like they know that they already have broccoli at home. You know, <laughs> right. you know what I, I mean? I was wondering where and, you're going with the broccoli thing. But I have like I have like broccoli at home, and I forget that I have broccoli at home, and then I get it at the store, and then I have too much broccoli, and some broccoli goes to waste. I feel like a systems thinker isn't buying too much broccoli. Um, I might be projecting. Okay. So continue on. You were saying I'm not too much of a s- systems thinker. And so, so that changes your approach. Yeah. I mean, I just feel like whenever we like get um, – New Year's is is like the quintessential time where we're putting so much goddamn pressure on ourselves to to change. I find that like change comes when I've been like reminded of something for like the fifth time and I hear someone say something in a certain way and it's like, ah, yes. Like it, it can't be from like – for me, at least, making this master plan, it's more for me like catching myself in the moment. Um, for and let me let me try to give you an example of this. Like, I don't, how kind are you to yourself when you talk to yourself? When you fuck, I up? have I what have become I have become much kinder since I studied self compassion. In previous years, I was just the worst. Like, if I spoke those things out loud, it it would sound like an like a like a a guard at the Stalag or something like a just horrible horrible right but now i'm a lot better okay yeah so i um i was similarly cruel to myself cruel much crueler to myself than i would be to anyone in my family um when i would forget an appointment when i would just do something um that i wasn't particularly proud of i would just like call myself a fucking idiot um and i talked to this guy who's who's definitely studied um self-compassion and psychology but he's just like a regular guy who writes a psychology blog his name's Stephen Handel and he taught me this thing uh that is that has helped me so much I I interviewed him like three years ago um and it's something that I think about all the time so I'll let him explain it this is uh, Stephen Handel you know, instead of saying, I'm really, really bad at math, which, you know, maybe you know, a lot of people speak in these exaggerated ways, um, you kind of downplay it a little bit by saying, mm, you know, I'm a little bad at math, or sometimes I have difficulty with math. You know, using words like sometimes and maybe or sorta or, you know, all, the, all those ways you can sort of downplay negative traits while still kind of accepting them and acknowledging them, but not exaggerating them. I would say break it down even further because characterizing things as bad or good is inherently problematic. Some things just are, right? Like, not to get all Buddhist on this, but like putting judgments on things as being either good or bad is making a judgment about things that are sometimes just value neutral. In other words, I'm bad at math. What does that even mean? Right? Like specifically, what does that mean? And and to to that, I would say, I think philosophically you're right but to actually be kinder to ourselves in the moment we're not gonna all of a sudden be like i'm not a fucking idiot that's 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 neutral like i think what what has helped me is instead of calling myself a big fucking idiot i I, i'm like you're you're being kind of foolish right now so really like the softening it i think has gotten me from like super angry like super cruel to myself to less cruel to myself um which i think is easier to go from from there than super cruel to myself than you know this kind of neutral Buddhist uh, mode. You know what I mean? I guess so. I mean, I think, you know, again, to, to, to take it from the the view of self-compassion here, and maybe there is a little bit of difference between us here. 
you know, from a self-compassion point of view, the way that you get rid of that angry voice in your head is by speaking to yourself kindly. You're saying do it in steps, right? Yes. It sounds like you're saying, yes. you know, soften it. I'm saying, no, make sure that if your brain says something awful to you, that you're, you make your brain say something equally sweet back. Give me an example. So, for example, let's say I drop my cell phone and crack my screen. And I'm like, you moron, this is the fourth time this year. How many times do you have to drop your goddamn phone? And then I would stop myself and say, look, you know, everybody in the entire world drops their phone. This is a mistake. It's not an, it, you know, this is not a an indication of my intelligence. Uh -huh. Suck it up. Pay the money to you know, get your screen fixed and let's look at cases that don't fall out of your hands. Like that is what I would do to my, I would talk back to that angry voice. I like that. Which goes back to what I was saying. Like that work, Stephen Handel's thing, I think works for me. Your thing works for you. Like there isn't this, this um, universal, you know, this universal thing that, that everyone can adhere to. Like everyone needs to wake up before 730 and do these 10 things. I think it's like, oh, yeah, th that could work. Okay. Well, we're going to take a break here, but we'll, we'll come back. And, and I know because you have a show that's all about advice, I know we're going to disagree here. And I, I think I probably suspect where it is. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll take a quick break. Still in, in broad strokes agreeing. Uh, this is Hear Me Out, a podcast from Slate. I'm Celeste Headley. Uh, and we'll be back in a moment. Stay with us. We all need advice sometimes. Right? Someone to say, I get it. I've been there too. But often it's hard to know where to turn, which is where we come in. Hi, I'm Carvel Wallace. And I'm Courtney Martin. We're both authors and journalists who love finding solutions to problems. Every week on Slate's How To Podcast, a listener comes on our show to receive advice from a world-class expert. We've covered everything from parents with radically different politics to people learning to love their insecurities. We've helped listeners breathe better, sleep better, and even have better sex. Speaking of sex, we're all getting screwed by a warming planet. <laughs> so we've also learned how to cope with climate change and how to say goodbye to our pets. Life is messy and complicated, but we're all in this together. So let's help each other. Look for How To from Slate, wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey, this is Mary Harris, host of Slate's daily news podcast, What Next? Slate's mission has always been to cut through the noise, boldly and provocatively. This election season and Supreme Court term are no different. Important coverage like this, though, it would not be possible without the support of our Slate Plus members. So I'm going to invite you to join us with a special offer. You can try your first three months for only 15 bucks. That is five bucks a month for your first three months of uninterrupted ad-free listening on every Slate podcast, member exclusive episodes and segments of your favorite shows like Amicus and the Political Gap Fest, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. Best of all, you'll be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism and analysis as we make sense of the news like no one else can. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcasts plus. Again, that is three months for only 15 bucks. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus. We're back. This is Hear Me Out, a podcast from Slate. Now, this is a podcast in which generally we bring people on uh, with whom I disagree and we figure out how to discuss the topic without trying to change each other's minds but learn from one another. Now, this time around is a little different because there seems to be a lot of agreement between Zach Rosen, maybe up until now, because here's the thing, Zach, and I, a, a, a perfect transparency here. You've had me on your podcast, The Best Advice Show, as a guest. You talked about uh, how, how we can talk to our racist neighbor. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I do give advice in my books. Like I'm saying, here's the best information I have, here's advice. But in in like in a on a more meta perspective, I'm kind of anti advice. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm anti giving advice to people. I have tried really hard to stop offering up advice to other people. Uh -huh. Um and I've 
I kind of avoid, well, I don't kind of, I avoid self-help books and I avoid advice shows in uh-huh. general. Uh-huh. So let me hear your best argument for giving advice, I guess. Yeah. Um, I think that it's dependent on a number of things. First of all, no one likes a self-righteous advice giver. No one does. It's true. And, there, and there's a lot of them out there. So don't offer don't offer advice unsolicited. Um, I think I think the advice taker needs to opt in to the advice, whether that's like subscribing to my show. That's that's an opt in. You know, I'm not telling. I'm not just like going up to my friends and being like, you know what you should do with your life. Um, so so those are those are a couple things. Um, and I think before offering advice, if you are going to be the advice giver, ask. Um, like in conversations when we're talking to our partners, our friends or someone, like sometimes they need different things. Sometimes they want our advice. They want to like problem solve together. Sometimes they just want us to listen. Um, sometimes, you know what I mean? Sometimes they just want to hug. So like before offering advice, be like, do you, do you want some advice or do you want me just to, to listen? So I think like the meta conversation around advice is very important before actually jumping into the advice itself. So the thing, you know, I'll tell you about this one CEO who um, switched his method from giving, offering advice and solutions to people um, to asking them, you know, I have some suggestions. If you want to hear them, just let me know. And like six years later, he stopped doing that because nobody ever came to him. Um, the, no you, one you ever know, asked I, him for it? No, ever. And I feel like when you ask people, can I give you some advice on this? I do feel there's a social pressure for people to say yes, mm-hmm. even if they don't really want to. Mm-hmm. Here's the thing. like Neurologically speaking... Even when we ask someone else for advice, mm-hmm. you know, there's only two situations in which conversation is emotionally and physiologically unhealthy for humans, right? Like we take, it's bad for us, right? Our markers go down. Okay. And they are, A, if it's hostile, right? I right. mean, that makes sense. But the other one is when we're getting advice. <laughs> Even if it's solicited. We hate it. And and when we talk hmm. about people getting defensive, that's in the neurological sense, literal Mm -hmm. like your body your brain begins to take the exact same actions in response to getting that advice as it does if you've been punched in the face Mm -hmm. (laughs) so yeah so and then the conversation's over right like they're not gonna well don't you think don't you think it depends on tone like for example taking an edit you're a reporter taking an edit is accepting advice isn't it it I'm is, sure. but I've had really had to train myself how to do that. Yes. And, and I know some people have. Yes. I mean, if training. you think back to like some of your earliest performance reviews, like those had no effect on you except to make you mad. Like for the most people freaking hate performance reviews and they find it nearly impossible to sift between the advice that's actually useful, might be useful for them, and the advice that is um, bogus. Yeah, yeah. And I, and this kind of goes back to what I was talking about in setting goals, because I don't think people are particularly good at getting feedback, at taking feedback. It cr- requires a huge amount of practice. Yes. And I don't think people are very good also in sifting between advice that might actually be helpful for them and or advice that they might follow because it aligns with what they already believe. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm trying to think of where I am interested in actually hearing advice and i agree that it it has taken taken i mean just getting feedback from my wife um you know we've been together for uh for 17 years and it took years for me to get comfortable with this idea that like she is offering feedback because she loves me not because she hates me you know um and so i think i think that's the big piece here is like Getting advice, I think we, we suck at kind of as a culture and also being in conflict, we suck at. But I, I think that we need to kind of, um, sorry, lean in to, to both of those things. Um, actually, there's, there was this advice, um, a psychologist that I recently talked to, her name is Dedeker Winston. She studied at the Gottman Institute. Um, and so she talks about this thing that couples can do um, called accepting bids. Like bids are like, and this is, you don't have to be in a partnership. It can be with your friends. It can be with the family. But like a bid is, you know, a bid for 
for someone's attention. Like, hey, come and look at this YouTube video. Like, that's a bid. Um, hey, can I tell you something? That's a bid. Um, so she has this to say about bids. And so in the research, they found that the healthiest and most long lasting and happiest couples responded to each other's bids. They turned toward each other's bids at least 70 to 80 percent of the time. Yes. You know, so not 100 percent, like not perfect. We don't have to be constantly dropping everything that we do to be at our partners every beck and call. But they turned toward the bids more often than they didn't. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about that, that like our relationships are really made up of these very tiny little interactions. Interesting. And I I feel like that has to be true in relationships because every successful relationship is always about accommodation and, and adjustment Mm -hmm. (laughs) in choosing battles and deciding (laughs) what's worth pushing back on Mm -hmm. and what's worth just getting up and moving the couch back to where your partner wanted it or whatever it may be. Right. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, In the real world though, I'm not sure that the bids would always work with like coworkers or um, your neighbor. Uh, I'm not sure that works when the person isn't, doesn't have a real investment in making that relationship work. Yeah, I think that's right. I think, I think it's for relationships that you are, you know, deeply engaged in nurturing. For example, like my mom, like, like I probably don't pick up the phone sometimes when I should, you know, like that's an example of like denying her bid. And if I just picked up the goddamn phone and put my work down for five minutes, it would make it would be it would make her so much happier. Um, I wouldn't have to then call her back later. Like, so I think I think you're absolutely right that it it is the bidding the bid um, advice is for deep relationships. So then that pr- kind of brings us back on a more general level with this the same problem I was talking about before, which is that people are terrible about taking feedback in a productive way. You know, it's interesting. I I got certified as a negotiation mastery or whatever it's called at Harvard Business School. And one of the things the Harvard Negotiation Project talks about is that we tend to completely discount advice that comes from our enemies, the people who don't Mm. like us. Mm. And it's such a loss Mm. because, you know, it's true that that person is seeing you at your worst, But that's important information. Like that's what you, that's how you behave at your worst. (laughs) And nobody else can give you that information except for the person that you hate and hates you. You know, this is my problem is that, you know, it's the same, it's true in any scientific study is that self-reporting is the least reliable data you can get. Yep. And this comes with both seeking out advice, like who do you trust to give you advice? We're not great at evaluating you know, it, it choosing which advice to follow and which advice we shouldn't follow. We're terrible at knowing which advice is actually going to help us get better. But we I don't, why are is even that, why te- is that true, though, that, that we're terrible at knowing which advice is going to help us get better? Because, I mean, it's, for me, I'm so not a scientist here. I'm so not a researcher. I'm, I feel like I'm like a an archivist of of random <laughs> advice. And like sometimes I hear it and it's just like, yes. Like when Dedeker told me that thing, I was like, you just changed my marriage. And I knew it. And so like, so, how is that? Why, why, why do I need to question, you know, the, the efficacy of that when I'm, I'm like already accepting more bids for my wife? So I'm not saying that we, we get it wrong every time, but we're very prone to accept and approve of the advice that aligns with what we already want to do anyway. Uh huh. And what's wrong with that? What's wrong with it is that we're missing out on advice that might be even more effective, that might actually get at the heart of a problem we don't even realize is a problem. For example, you um, identifying whatever is going wrong with your marriage. Maybe half the time you're right. This is what's going wrong with my marriage. I'm not. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with your marriage. I'm yeah. saying every marriage is sure. accommodation. Absolutely. But the other half of the time, you may be missing stuff mm-hmm. because you have this unconscious dialogue going on saying, this sounds more right to me. Mm-hmm. And my me, Celeste, as somebody who has been a, now has been a researcher since uh, 2009 or so, uh, I can tell you that your gut is the least accurate and reliable Um, guide in the whole panoply that is Zach Rosen. Mm -hmm. Your gut is the one you don't want to trust. Celeste Hadley says, fuck your gut, trust your enemies. 
I, I don't say trust your enemies. I'm just saying it's important data. I hey, I mean, I am I've gotten really interested in trying to uh, uncover what my blind spots are because we all have them. Um, yeah, and I ask constantly. Tell me how you ask. So, for example, uh, I was, t- you know, I take long walks with my dogs and there's a whole dog walking community because yeah. I live across the street from Rock Creek Park in oh. Metro D.C. And so we're talking about another one of our friends and we were discussing like a really pernicious blind spot this person has, which I will not describe because they would know exactly <laughs> who they are then. Okay. And this is a smart, insightful, yeah. you know, person. Yeah. And they have this glaring blind spot that leads them to do very illogical things. Wow. And so I set, turned to my friend and said, okay, everybody has those. Everyone yes. has those blind spots. And it would be so helpful for me if you told me what mine is. Yes. <laughs> I was like, what, what are the things that when you're talking to other people about me, you're like, oh my God, I can't believe Celeste does this. She's so smart. Why does she... What is it? Fill yes. in the blank for me yes. here. Yes. And she didn't give it to you, though. She said there wasn't a glaring one. Like, yeah. she mentioned some stuff that were, like, borderline adorable. And I'm like, well, that's not, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not, you know, helpful. I mean, she mentioned that I, I go over the top in throwing parties. Everybody knows that. Okay, I mean, I'm. I'm sorry. I'm exactly. That's, that's spot. exactly. Yeah. That's just you know. No, that's a re- that's a really interesting thing because I, uh, I I feel like I have gotten better at seeking them out. Um, and who do you think it's the people that know us best that w- that would know our blind spots? It, I mean, yes, I do think it's not helpful when someone doesn't have a lot of interaction with you yeah because they'll be basing their judgment just on a few interactions or maybe it's somebody who only sees you in one particular context if somebody only knows me as a as a speaker like a a, a public speaker they they don't see me in my entirety right so that's not particularly helpful right but that doesn't mean they have to like me Mm -hmm. you know yeah getting information from people who don't like me and that that's important information I've been I've been, I've been wanting to build a series around feedback. Um, like I was thinking about like city council people, for example, mm. like just the amount of feedback they get that is like, you know, two pieces of feedback would completely like contradict, you know, the other and just like, how do you how can we be better feedback takers and get the right feedback? Um, I'm, I'm really interested in this. So thanks for bringing it up. And I, and I don't know I have any of the answers for it. Okay. Well, on that note of us uh, not really disagreeing, but uh, you saying I don't know enough of to disagree, which frankly is a freaking fantastic response. And it's not normal for people to be like, I don't know enough about that to give you my opinion. <laughs> Most people are like, let me read a couple paragraphs off of Google real quick, and then I'll come back with a, <laughs> with a spicy opinion. In any case, on that note, we will take another break. Uh, I'm Celeste Headley, and I'm speaking with Zach Rosen on the podcast. Hear me out. Stay with us. We're back. This is Hear Me Out, a podcast from Slate that's all about disagreeing without being a a jerk. Um, And today we're talking about the setting of resolutions. And I just want to do a quick summary. You and I agree that setting those big revolutions, I'm going to lose 50 pounds, Mm -hmm. is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, We agree that you can set small iterative goals and they can be helpful I think I disagree on the extent to which people are good at at choosing those goals. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you have more faith in people to choose healthy, productive goals for themselves. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, I have I have faith in people to, despite you know us not knowing our blind spots, which is what we talked about. But I do have faith in people figuring things out for themselves based on. what kind of makes them light up, um, which I think a particular piece of advice can do. And so, so yes, I do. I think if anyone's like actively interested in self-improvement in like a a real earnest, humble way, like I think that they can be trusted to curate 
the the kind of person they want to become. So I just feel like the self improvement industry is it can be helpful, but on balance is destructive. Yeah, I mean, it's it's such a it's such a a broad thing. Like you know, going to therapy is part of the self improvement industry, right? And like signing up for like some like twenty week executive coaching course for fifty grand is also part of the self improvement industry. So. Well, I mean, there's been a, a, just on that particular thing, you know, there's a bit all that revelation about co- those life coaches and how, you know, damaging their advice can be and how they have no, many of them have no certifications whatsoever. Yeah. Um, they just become life coaches. Uh, so there's that. But when yeah. I say self-improvement, I mean like all the the books and the, that are often accompanied by videos and often accompanied by subscriptions. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that in unbalance is destructive to society and also to humanity. Um, I can't. That is them. my opinion. Oh, I can't you can't. I, I don't read those books. You know, I like novels. I I like uh, I like Slate dot com. Uh, no, I mean, <laughs> I I really don't. Haven't read much self help. Which it, it just so goes, do you? Yeah. Do you think that your your big advice um, podcast is self help? ish i think it's self-help but i i I feel like it's like folk self-help um like i feel like it's like uh you know common it's uh it's it's idiosyncratic it's not it's not like self-improvement with a with a capital s um like i get pitched a lot now um for like these coaches to come on my show and they are those are always just like the worst interviews because they just sound so sure of themselves yeah um, and so like, I love when people are like, you know, actually this thing has been, has been working for me. Um, so like, I feel like any, any kind of advice needs to be imbued with humility. And when it's not, I'm, I'm suspicious of it. So how do you set resolutions then? To me, the healthiest way to set a goal is to realize that something is not, um, serving you or something is kind of not going the way you want it to in your life yeah. and go out in search of as much information as possible on lots and lots of different ideas on mm-hmm. how people have solved them and spend a huge amount of time, frankly, reading mm-hmm. and researching and then let experiment. Mm-hmm. Say, well, let me go with this strategy first and then keep going. That to me is a healthy way to set a goal and try to reach it. That's researcher Headley right there. Um, yeah. Like I, that's just not who I am. So I know I know that I'm not going to read 20 books about something. Um, I'm more prone to just like start start messing around. Um, and if it feels good, then I, I, I continue it. Like that's the only way I stumbled on. The only long lasting workout regimen of my entire life only emerged in the last like couple of years after like I've always tried different things um, and, and have failed. So, okay. Yeah, I mean, I can see how that would work, but it also, I guess for me, I'm like, wait, you're wasting all that time. <laughs> That's like the Jackson doing, Pollock approach to goal setting. You're doing so much front time work, though. You're doing so. You're front loading a lot of labor there with your research, though. I mean, I guess so, but I'll, you know, then then the time that I'm pursuing my goal is super focused and directed and efficient. And I love that for you. That's great for <laughs> Celeste. Which again, someone can be hearing this and they're like, hell yeah, Celeste, you're my people. Um, and other people are like, no, not going to I mean, the scattershot approach, though, I mean, it sounds like it works for you. But I feel like what ends up happening is somebody's walking through a bookstore and goes passes by the self-help aisle and they see something on how to be more elegant. And they're like, yeah, damn right. I want to be more elegant when they're not an elegant person. <laughs> yes. Right. Like they're the lab. Spot. Right. They're they the Labrador the of people. And so they're going to waste a huge amount of time trying to be something that they aren't. And they're tr- they're they're they've have a solution in search of a problem which is the way that so many people set goals. They, they find these solutions, the advice other people give and go, oh yeah, I want to be that. I want to do that. And that it, it's not a problem in their life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, this is going back to like my theory around you hear something random on my show and sometimes it sticks and sometimes it doesn't. Like for example, like another one, um, this has changed my life, Celeste. I heard it six months ago from Daniel Estrin. He's the Jerusalem correspondent at NPR, one of my dear friends. And 
he was on, he used to be a correspondent for The World, that PRI, BBC show, yep. The World. And Lisa Mullins, the host, one day was doing a two-way with him, like an interview with him. And at the end, this is a pre-taped thing, at the end of the interview, she was like, Daniel Estrin, thanks for coming on the show. And he's like, thank you. And she's like, this wasn't live. So she said, no, 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 just say you're welcome. And it hit him like a ton of bricks. Like, just accept a thanks with your welcome, which I didn't realize I wasn't doing. Like, we are so often, someone thanks us and we're like, oh, no problem. Thank you. But like, if you just say you're welcome, I just notice like my shoulders drop when I say you're welcome. Like, this sounds so dumb, um, but it's actually true. Again, this is so not lofty. This is just like the, this tiny little thing. And I feel like a thanks lands so much better on someone when you're not trying to deflect it. Um, and so, like, I heard that and I'm like, yes, I do that. I, despite our blind spots, like, I know that I'm bad at accepting thanks. And now I say you're welcome. And I feel like I'm, I'm not a completely different person, a slight, a slightly different person. Do you say I mean, you're welcome? That's, that, I do. I mean, I try yeah. as much as I can. That has not been one of my areas to to fix mm -hmm. um although it has i mean i'm a woman so i've had to really work hard to stop saying i'm sorry and yes. apologizing yes so that has been a, a focus of fixing my language but saying you're welcome is not but as a host i will say that as a host it does become irritating when every single time you say thank you somebody says no thank you yeah um every yeah. time yeah so no i get it Wait, I'm interested in the sorry thing because, um, you know, I'm from the Midwest. We are a sorry people. <laughs> um, have you figured? I remember I one time I was in a public bathroom, Celeste. I was in the bathroom and someone walked in on me and I apologized. <laughs> Once I, then I knew something was wrong. But something was very wrong. Um, have you figured how have you how have you um, tried to unlearn the over sorrying? So I I mean, that's literally just part of every single day reminding me to um, have that conversation with myself. You know, meditation has taught me to slow down um, and, and not identify with my thoughts, right? Like just because a thought comes into my yep. head, that's not Celeste. Yep. It's just a thought. Yep. Um, and so the impulse will come into my head of apologize, Celeste. And I'll be like, no, thank you. I will not. <laughs> Great, <laughs> and I have had to learn how to how to speak back to myself. Um, yeah, that's great. So, uh, you know, that's that works for me because I meditate yeah. a, a lot. Um, but it, it that may not work for everybody else. Some people, I always suggest you might try getting a buddy and saying, "Hey, I'm tell that person I'm trying to stop apologizing." So if you hear me, here's what you do. If you hear me apologize, either tug on my sleeve or or say this particular word or whatever it is, just to remind me I'm trying not to do that. The accountability buddies. Bless those Accountability people. buddies. I yeah, love they them. work on school trips just as well as they work in <laughs> adulthood. Oh. Um, yeah. So, okay. It sounds like on this particular subject of uh, setting goals and resolutions, I feel like we're like 85% in agreement. Mm-hmm. You agree yeah. with that? <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I agree that we're mostly agreed. Yeah. Um, you don't. You don't trust. Uh, you don't think we should trust ourselves in the advice we seek. I do. Yeah, I do not. I think that's the biggest. That's the biggest disconnect. Yeah, I have but, a yeah. scientist dis. I have a scientist skepticism of of self reports. Period. Yes. Yeah, and I have like a stoner's optimism for like, yeah, man. I think you. I think uh, you should trust yourself. <laughs> Yeah, so there you go. On those things, we're kind of at the opposite ends of the spectrum. But everything else, we're kind of in agreement, which is to say, if you, the listener, are getting ready to set yourself a giant, big, overarching goal for the new year, we're not going to stop you. But Zach Rosen would advise against it. I would probably just send you a whole bunch of research articles showing you that it won't work. Yeah, and that, and, and I'm saying that's too many PDFs. Um, and, in, <laughs> and instead... What God, I, would say, I love a PDF. <laughs> I know you do. I know you do, Celeste. Um, I saw, I've, I've, seen, I've seen your desk at work. Um, but uh, I would say, just, just like you, Celeste, have been stopping yourself from saying I'm sorry, when you, are, when you listener, are like considering this big lofty thing, first of all, take off big and lofty. And there's this phrase that a novelist taught me on my show. His name is Brian Selfon. Um, who is working a full-time job 
uh, while he was trying to write a novel. And his thing was, you know, he would sit at the beginning of the process. He was like, I want to write like the great American novel. And he realized like that is completely unrealistic. And it was just like taking it seven steps down. And his phrase, which I think about all the time, is aim for meh. I mean, just aim for meh. Like, don't even try to make a beautiful sentence. Just like write a word and then write another word. So like when you're coming up with this big lofty goal, just aim for meh. Aim for like something more than nothing, but like just just above nothing, you know, and then you can build from there. Okay. I mean, that's great advice. And I, I would give one more piece after saying that people shouldn't give advice. I will give one more, which is in all of the becoming, don't forget to be mm-hmm. who you are and and stop improving and just enjoy you as you are. You're okay. <laughs> You're okay. I couldn't agree more with that. So do you make resolutions? Have you made a resolution for the new year? Is yesterday the the first day of the rest of your life uh, toward being an improved human being? How are you feeling about that resolution? And and I, we wonder if this conversation changes your mind about resolutions and goal setting in general. Not that it needs to. Either way, whatever you're feeling about goals after hearing this show, we want to hear from you about how you set goals, what kind of goals you set, and what you think of my position and of Zach's position. Share your thoughts. It's hearmeout at slate.com. Hear Me Out is a podcast from Slate. The show is produced by Maura Curry. Ben Richmond is the Senior Director of Podcast Operations. And Alicia Montgomery is VP of Slate Audio. I'm your host, Celeste Headley. Until next time, speak your mind, but keep it open. Hold up. 